I'm Pat Nolan. I am the uh, director of the Center for Criminal Justice Reform at the American Conservative Union Foundation. In 1994, when uh, the crime bill passed, um, it was a time of uh, anxiety. Uh, people were afraid. Uh, there had been uh, uh, an increase in violent crime. Uh, the number of murders in New York City was up to about 2,400 a year. Um, and uh, because of television, even people in Odebol to Iowa and places like that knew about murders that were occurring in the city. So everybody was afraid of that. And conservatives were relying on the tried and true, well, let's just uh, have longer sentences and lock people up, lock more people up and build more prisons to accommodate that. Uh, the interesting thing is, 1994 uh, was the last year of rising crime rates, and it's been a steady decline ever since. So before the 94 crime bill even went into effect, crime was already beginning to drop. And in New York City, instead of 2,400 murders in 94, it was down to less than 400 last year. Now, that's an astounding change, and that's one figure you can't lie about. Bodies in a morgue are there or they're not, and to go from 2,400 a year to less than 400, that's truly an astounding change. And it didn't come out about because of stronger sentences and more prisons, because it had already begun to drop before they, they went into effect. Uh, one of the things we found is that the states that have cut their prison population intelligently, like we suggest reserving beds for truly dangerous, their crime rate has dropped more than those that have continued building prisons and expanding their prison population. So actually they've gotten more safety for the public from less money. I was uh, convicted of one count of racketeering uh, for a campaign contribution that I accepted that turned out to be part of a sting. And so uh, I had the unique uh, observation point of uh, uh, being in prison and having a chance to see how the institution operated in reality rather than the Potemkin villages that uh, I'd been led through when I was a member of the legislature. Uh, the reality was quite different. Um, uh, not much was done uh, to change uh, the hearts or the habits of the inmates. Uh, virtually nothing was done to prepare them to be um, uh, supporting, self-supporting and supportive of their families when they uh, were released. Uh, and in fact, oftentimes the guards would say, see in a few months as they released them through the gate. It was just the expectation that they'd come back. Uh, that was a shock to me. As a conservative legislator, I thought the prisons were really working hard to uh, to reform the character of inmates and that people would leave prison better than they went in. Uh, I was shocked when I saw that instead it was a giant bureaucracy, that um, the prison system was a giant bureaucracy that grew on itself uh, and, uh, frankly, cared little about public safety or about changing the inmates. Where, where I am now is we obviously need prisons. There are people that pose a great threat uh, to us um, uh, and, uh, you know, prey upon uh, weak, weaker people in the community. Uh, but we've gone far beyond them. We've widened the net to the point where uh, prisons are way overused. Uh, prisons are for people we're afraid of, uh, but we're filling them with people we're just mad at. Uh, they've broken the rules of society, but they don't pose a threat to us. We don't stay awake at night worrying about the kid that's stealing small amounts of pot on the street, uh, and that they're locked up. Uh, and what I saw was how much was being spent to keep these people off the street then you, their families would end up on welfare. Then when they're released, they couldn't get a job. So what we've done is taken someone that was already having difficulty making it as a productive member of society and making it virtually certain that they can't uh, be a contributing member of society. 
Uh, and so uh, I, I now support sentences that reserve costly prison beds for people we're afraid of, and instead for those we're just mad at, uh, leaving the community and um, work with them. Usually there's a drug or an alcohol problem or a mental health issue, so put the money that would be spent incarcerating them into mental health treatment and uh, drug and alcohol uh, rehab. That takes care of most uh, most of those uh, people. And for the states that have done it, and believe it or not, Texas was the, the first state that really began this effort under Governor Perry. They eliminated three prisons that they had plans to build. They've closed three ones that were already open. Uh, they uh, now have drug treatment as soon as an inmate is eligible for it, they get that drug treatment. They've set up community drug treatment and mental health programs, and they've saved $3 billion for the taxpayers in the process. The last most important point is a crime. The crime rate is now at the lowest point it's been since 1968. So they've shown that we can intelligently cut the prison population, limiting it to people that are truly dangerous, and keep the public safe and save a bundle in the meantime. Since Texas did it, South Carolina has, Georgia has, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Missouri. Um, I'm, there are more states than that. It is uh, truly uh, a wave sweeping the states. And as a conservative, you know, that's the way things should be done. Uh, Justice Brandeis referred to the great laboratory of the states. Here we've got 50 states to try things in. The states are showing the way to keep our community safe at less cost and less destruction of the lives of the people we put in the system. That's healthy. That's uh, federalism at its best. There's an additional aspect that is really important for conservatives, which is that the power to imprison somebody uh, is the greatest authority we give government. They strip you of uh, your identity, uh, they take you from your family, from your job, from your community, from your church. Uh, they control every aspect of your life. Now, that's a tremendous power to give to the government, and it ought to be used sparingly. Uh, and there's a growing concern among conservatives that uh, the power of the prosecutor has gotten so large that they are a threat to individual liberty. Now that we've criminalized so many acts that are benign and morally neutral uh, simply because we have thousands of statutes that no one can keep track of, that that's an unhealthy position for society. That's too much authority to give to government. And there's a greater and greater movement of conservatives to reject that. The conversation on uh, criminal justice reform uh, has significantly changed. It was a, you know, red state versus blue state type of dividing line or a wedge issue where uh, some people said uh, uh, liberals were too soft on crime, uh, conservatives were accused of being insensitive uh, and too tough on crime, especially for poor and uh, people of color. And uh, I, I've seen around the country, the states as well as at the federal level, uh, that that uh, that conversation is behind us in most cases. Uh, the the left and right, uh, especially reform-minded conservatives and progressives, have joined together on a host of issues that um, that that are sensitive to the. Uh, the great um, wounds that have been uh, uh, done to uh, our inner cities and to people uh, uh, that are poor and uh, don't have the resources. Um, and uh, on issues like the Prison Rape Elimination Act, you had, uh, you know, very conservative senators uh, like Sam Brownback joining with Ted Kennedy uh, to fight that, and Jeff Sessions very conservative former prosecutor from Alabama, strongly supporting that. Uh, the Second Chance Act, you had Frank Wolf and Bobby uh, Scott in the House, uh, 
conservative Republican and a liberal Democrat joining together uh, to pass that. You had Tom DeLay and Steny Hoyer working together in the House to pack the, pass the Second Chance Act, uh, which is the first time in my life that uh, the legislators said we had to care about what happened to prisoners after they were released. Uh, the the uh, the awful disparity between crack and powder cocaine has been significantly reduced, and it was a bipartisan support. Jeff Sessions worked as hard for that as did Pat Leahy. So uh, you've seen this coming together uh, on these issues in the in the Senate. The group of young uh, conservative and libertarian senators. Uh, we're supportive of the uh, safety valve act on mandatory minimums. Uh, you know, Ted Cruz, uh, Mike Lee, uh, 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 Rand Paul, Jeff Flake, all of them, you know, relatively young senators saying that this sentencing is out of, um, out of proportion to the harm that's done. Uh, and that's, that's one of the rubrics we use is that the harm done by a sentence should never exceed the harm done by the underlying crime. And yet so many of our penalties are disproportionate in that way. They end up wreaking far more damage than was ever caused by uh, the offender in the first place. I think uh, the, uh, the beginning of the change among conservatives was Chuck Colson, who had been Nixon's counsel and went to prison for seven months um, as a result of uh, leaking an FBI file on Daniel Ellsberg. And uh, when he walked out the prison gates, and rather than returning to practice law, which we could have, he could have, instead he dedicated himself to taking the gospel into prisons. He had promised the men he served time with that he wouldn't forget them. And he reached out to them and their families and started prison fellowship. And from that sprang another part of the ministry called Justice Fellowship, which was to address the systemic problems. And so, for instance, the disproportionality of punishment is very biblical. The uh, lex talionis, or eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that was a limitation on punishment. It said when someone does harm to you, the, the, the retribution should be no greater than the harm that's done, because they used to go and burn down a village for, you know, uh, a theft or something like that. And so instead it was a proportionality. We're told uh, measure for measure and pound for pound. That's, that's true justice. And uh, we've, uh, our sentencing structure is way out of whack. So uh, Chuck Wilson gave the clarion call, and many uh, religious uh, leaders have stepped forward. Billy Graham has been very supportive. Uh, Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council, uh, Jim Dobson a Focus on the Family, Gary Bauer of American Values. Uh, all these religious leaders have stepped up and said, uh, we can't treat our people this way, that this is, uh, there's too great a price we're paying as a society for uh, essentially writing these people off, warehousing them, and condemning them to a life where they can never get back on their feet. Um, and that has been, uh, frankly, on the Prison Rape Elimination Act, it was the impetus. The faith-based legislators were the ones that were the impetus behind it. Uh, and the Second Chance Act, too, uh, were uh, the legislators of faith of both parties stepped forward. And what that did was allow uh, people like Tom DeLay and John Conyers to work together because they both share that faith. And the view that each human being has dignity, that we carry that image of God, the imago dei, and that's what gives us value, and that government should never strip us of that dignity that we have as a child of God. Uh, if I were to uh, advise the President and Congress on a crime bill going forward, it would be to uh, first distinguish between uh, people that we're afraid of and those we're just mad at and limit prison beds to just those we're afraid of. But I wouldn't give up on those that we're afraid of. They can change too. There have been many cases of people we've worked with that now 
uh, lead very uh, uh, important lives in the community, coaching little league teams and uh, being in the church choir. I mean, they really are contributing members of society, and they did horrible things before. So people can change. So I wouldn't give up on those, but I wouldn't put in with them with people that have done violence, I wouldn't take low-risk people and put them in with them because uh, they're preyed upon by the more violent prisoners. The prison rape, it's usually the low-risk offenders that are not traditionally viewed as criminals that are taken advantage of in prison and suffer from the violence and intimidation. Uh, so I would make that distinction. I wouldn't send low-level uh, or low-risk prisoners to prison. The second thing I would do is put more, more money into treatment so much of crime is driven by addiction, either to drugs or alcohol. And there are programs that work. People can uh, overcome their addiction. And our resources should be going to that. It's so much cheaper to treat them in the community than to house them, warehouse them in prison. And the astounding thing is, uh, when I was in the legislature, uh, I heard all the time, well, at least when they're in prison, they're not doing drugs. Wrong. Wrong. There were uh, when I was in uh, prison, there were as many drugs or more than when I uh, on college when I went to college. They come in the officers' lunchbox and sneaked in by people. Uh, there are plenty of drugs in prison. Uh, we saw that with Ted Bundy in those awful tapes. You know, here he was high uh, on uh, on the tapes inside prison. So uh, the, the, it's a myth that uh, that there are no drugs available in prison, but. There isn't drug treatment available. Uh, the former uh, director of the Bureau of Prisons told Congress, I guarantee you there's drug treatment available in every one of our prisons. Well, technically that's true, but it's not available to everybody that needs it in the prisons. Only 10% of addicts get treatment while they're in prison. There just isn't room in the classes for them. They haven't appropriated the money to take them. So what good did it do to send them to prison when they aren't getting treatment for the thing that got them there in the first place? It makes no sense. And then the the uh, scandal of the mentally ill in our jail and prisons, it's heartbreaking. These people are not bad people. They're sick, and they need treatment. And with the proper medication and oversight, they can lead very productive lives. Uh, and they don't need to be behind bars where they're victims themselves and then oftentimes lash out, uh, you know, in, in retribution for that. Uh, it, it, the, the last thing is about mentally ill. The sheriffs and police don't like handling them because they're not, they're not mental health counselors. They're not trained to handle that. They shouldn't be put in uh, jails because they make management of jails almost impossible. So there's a better way to do it, and it's cheaper to treat them in civilian facilities, not in uh, jails. Uh, first is we're uh, having success. Uh, we're seeing the light go on uh, in people uh, across the political spectrum and around the country. But I, I'd also say it's my faith. Um, I see God at work giving us uh, chances that, you know, in my old political life, I would have said, nah, there's no chance. When when we started on the Prison Rape Elimination Act, everybody said, you guys are nuts. Nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody will do anything about it. And frankly, politically, that's right. But I'll tell you, God just opened doors and opened hearts, and it passed both houses unanimously. Uh, you know, which is truly astounding for a bill that everybody said was dead. Uh, the, the Second Chance Act, the people in the Bureau of Prisons scoffed at it, said, oh, that's got no chance. We don't need to pay attention to that. That passed overwhelmingly. So uh, a lot of it is I, I do see uh, God clearing the way for us. And, and, and I see the number of people, good, um, you know, important members of the community that are taking the stand to say, we can do better than this. Our prisons should be helping people get better, not making them worse. My vision for what our uh, society would be like is that uh, while prisons are necessary, they would be limited in number, that we would have uh, worked with people to teach them to resolve disputes through restorative justice, through um, 
bringing understanding and healing the broken relationships that is a crime. Uh, that won't work in every situation, but we don't even try it in most. So I think restorative justice, if that were the way we handled things, everything from playground disputes on up through uh, serious crimes. Um, but on the other hand, my fear is that there will be some awful crime that occurs uh, at the hands of someone who was let out uh, through uh, a program uh, the, for early release that does something awful and that that will cause uh, the public to become frightened again and demand that the legislature uh, start, um, you know, uh, locking up more people and expanding uh, our prisons. Uh, and we're always just sadly one incident away from that. But you're optimistic. Yes, I am, because, uh, frankly, we see the number of people who, because of our programs, are out in the community holding down jobs, supporting their family, paying taxes, uh, being involved in their church and their community. Uh, there, uh, uh, Chuck Colson said, those are the living monuments to our work. He said, don't build any statue or anything. I mean, the monuments to our work are living. And they're there, and that's I, you know, I I say that's absolutely true. We can see those uh, men and women who've had their lives transformed and uh, are now good citizens and good neighbors.